Hi, everyone. We're back. And I'm really pleased to be able to present a panel with authors who are both working with and uh, utilizing AI as part of narrative structures. Um, as uh, we get towards the end of this day, we're dealing with some very complicated and nuanced issues in artificial intelligence. And I know that our two panelists will be able to help us understand their perspectives and how uh, they're utilizing these tools in their work. So I'd like to have our panelists introduce each other. Uh, if you could just give a quick introduction of, of what you, who you are, what you're involved with, um, and then uh, keep it fairly short so that we can start generating, uh, I think a long list of questions that we probably both have of each other as well as uh, our audience has as well. Um, so just, Coming from left to my right, Sean, could you? Hi, uh, I'm Sean Michaels. I'm in Montreal. I'm the author of three novels, most recently, Do You Remember Being Born? that was published earlier this month with Astro House. Um, I'm pre before that, I spent years as a music critic, and I still work uh, writing nonfiction for places like The New Yorker and The Walrus. Great. Greg. Hi, my name is Greg Hurwitz. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm the author of 24 Thrillers, most recently the Orphan X series. And I've also uh, worked in comic books. I've written a bunch of comics uh, and a few films and television shows as well. And I'm the co-president of International Thriller Writers. And we conducted some surveys uh, on AI uh, in that capacity over at ITW. Excellent. So we just came out of a discussion on uh, some of the legal landscape issues uh, around AI. And I, I guess just trying to continue that conversation before we move into some of the aspects of uh, how AI impinges on our understanding of creativity and how you're working with AI in your works. Um, let's just, if, if you will, get it out of the way. Um, what are you concerned about? with AI and how are you thinking about, um, uh, you know, putting your own constraints on uh, your publisher relationship? What does that look like to you as an author, Sean? Yeah, I mean, so I, I obviously there's a lot of things to be concerned about at different levels. Um, for me, I think um, the primary concern I have is not at the level of AI companies scraping um, content, um, but rather at the, the question of what do we do to help writers be okay and negotiate fair working conditions and, and, and uh, the right conditions to do good work in a world where generative AI is resulting in such a flood of content, of written content, much of which will be mediocre, but some of which might sort of uh, even be able to start trending towards good and that's coming from essentially freelancers this flood of kind of spammy content um, how do we defend ourselves both kind of creatively and legally but also how do we establish relationships with our publishers and with our audiences that allow us to keep doing creative good generative in that other sense kind of work um, in an, in those economic conditions great okay greg what about you well, what's on your mind I'd say for me, I'm, I'm optimistic in a lot of regards uh, that there's, there is a way through. There's a way that we know how to navigate this within the skills and excellence of the community, both in publishing and the creative communities. I'd say my biggest concern or the biggest way that I would state it is, is we want to emerge from this with humans being Sorcerer or Mickey and not necessarily the marching mops with the buckets of water. Um, and the biggest concern that I have really is that we might lose control of the shared understanding. You know, we've, we've done a lot of polling. A lot of people are in agreement of what to do. And there's a way to proceed in this that I think makes a lot of sense. And my primary concern is that we're going to lose control of the narrative before we can establish those safeguards in place. And we don't want to lose control of the narrative to the point to the point that sort of AI and polarization and news silos have taken that over and we've sort of lost control in our internecine bickering over what the case could be. Um, so what do you, when you say narrative, what, what are you thinking of? What, what story is that that you're concerned mm. about us losing control? 
Well, as with most things, I believe uh, in, in, let's just say, the country and perhaps in the world, but let's just talk about America. I mean, about 80 percent of Americans agree on almost everything. Um, and, you know, when we went out and did polling, we, we looked at readers. Ninety three percent of readers don't want to buy a book that's written entirely by AI. Ninety seven percent of readers want publishers to state overtly on the cover if a book has been written using AI. What we see is a demand for transparency, first and foremost. People don't want to be duped. Um, the, the author surveys that we felt within the industry and with industry experts are very similar. 94% of people want to see some sort of code of conduct um, that is being used for that. And I think if we can start with transparency and focus on solutions that elevate uh, innovation and competition among technology... Um, rather than moving in towards a technopoly model, um, then there's a way that the industry at large uh, can match and give readers what they want, what in fact artists want, and what we're also seeing from agents and publishers. Because if things move to a straight game of kind of uh, regenerative or generative AI driven by algorithms, the winners are not going to be necessarily the big five publishers or publishers in general. Uh, and authors, I think it's going to move to tech companies are going to be able to outcompete in that regard. And we have an enormous reservoir of resources and excellence um, where there's there's a lot more accord than we might think about what we need to do moving forward. It's just the case if we can get those things in place and elevate the right things and do so in a manner that feels forthright and honest and plays fairly with consumers and with readers. So both of you have talked about concerns over content generated by AI, one of our earlier panels noted that uh, the time that Tom Clancy is actually authoring his own works is now past. It does not necessarily prevent there from being future Tom Clancy novels. So in some ways, both of you as creative artists, um, and, we'll, and we'll get to how you're utilizing AI in your own trade in a second, but um, you know, it's conceivable that uh, creative AI applications might further your reach, whether it's creating a translation on your behalf or um, perhaps creating other kinds of derivatives. Um, uh, you know, I know Greg, you've got uh, your hand historically into different kinds of authored content. So in what way do, do you understand that um, we have to protect our creative impulse from AI versus utilizing it to expand our creative reach and capabilities. Sean. For me, the question becomes much simpler if you kind of un decouple the economic questions from the creative questions. So in a world where um, the question of AI, you know, did the AI author this? Is it copyrightable? Who gets paid? How much do I get paid? How much is my publisher spending on this or that? How much unlicensed? or licensed AI content is flooding bookshops and taking away from my sales. In a world where that's less of an issue, I don't know what world that is, maybe a, a, maybe a world where, where, uh, where everyone is economically taken care of. But anyway, in that world, you can kind of uncouple the AI creative questions. And personally, I feel that artists can afford to be less insecure about things. I used some AI tools for very specific reasons in writing this book, which is about a poet who collaborates with AI. And in so doing, I don't feel that I gave up my substance as an artist to use this tool. And I believe very strongly in the power of creative people, of artists, of painters, of writers, to use whatever tools are at their disposal, just as I believe in their power to draw inspiration from whatever forces are in their life to make inventive, creative, beautiful work. This uh, refer, reminds me of what you just said about, about, about excellence and being the sorcerer. I believe in that power. And I think that it's hard for me to imagine a world 10 or 20 years from now where another generation of artists isn't making incredible work that is truly like human driven, but that draws on these tools in interesting ways, just as you know, it's almost impossible to think of fine art today without uh, thinking about the way the internet or photography have you know, disrupted and changed that. And so I think if you're able to separate those things, we can open ourselves up to the possibility that art has enough integrity and power, as long as we take care of each other to kind of survive and flourish beside and with AI tools but then we do have to worry about that first part. And, and I think that if we can try to tackle that first part of money, 
then we can stop being quite so worried and threatened, or we should stop feeling so threatened by the tech part. And Greg, how are you thinking across the kinds of content that you've authored about the role of AI as a useful creative energy in, into the work that you're doing? Well, I'd like to elaborate on a point that Sean made, and that's around this issue of human excellence. And what, what people want to see all the time is going to be human excellence. People didn't want to watch Deep Blue play a chess match against Deep Blue. They wanted to see how Kasparov could fare. No one wants to watch an AI-generated basketball game. We want to see Michael Jordan soar. Uh, it's a similar thing now at the forefront in the way that Sean's discussing, um, because we have to, what people are interested in seeing is a version of human excellence. And when we're talking about Clancy and his, and the people who might be writing his books now, you know, in some ways with the death of the Midwest that we talk a lot about, we forget sometimes that it's necessary to create an ecosystem. It's not just about human excellence of the one person who can kind of prevail and figure something out. Um, we also need to be building and creating an ecosystem so that artists and writers have a place to sort of develop and create their skills. That could be somebody co-writing for Patterson. It could be somebody helping Monet paint haystacks. We've always had through history the use of different people that, that are being funneled in a tradition of excellence and a tradition of beauty um, and in a tradition of the art where they're, where they're learning this. And what we find is that there is a lot of excellence within our industry. And if we're not willing to move away from that, in the interest of sort of quarterly reports and earnings, we've seen what happened with the big rush to streaming. It turns out that that model that was driven primarily by, you know, financial moves to appease Wall Street overlords didn't turn out to be as beneficial or to be as lucrative in the long term, in the middle to long term, um, as maybe holding true to some of the core values that sustain the more traditional studios. Um, and likewise, if there's a big rush into AI, we might find ourselves in a similar place right now where we can be sitting in bed, clicking through Apple TV and have half a trillion dollars of entertainment on display, and none of it feels particularly special. And we're always going to have the emergence of people or people are going to want to see the emergence of something that feels truly special, that feels artistic. Um, and it goes to a third point, which I think we can discuss to some extent, which is the need for this, the need to have transparency so that people understand what they're engaging with and they're stating what it is that they want to receive. They want to receive something where they don't feel they're being duped. They want to feel like they're watching human excellence because that's what tends to captivate us. That's why we watch the Olympics. We want an ecosystem in place that can nourish and sustain the groundwaters of this industry, but we also need community. And one of the things that I think we've seen extensively is that People, we don't always know what it is that we think we want. We might think that we want that we can push a button and create a Tom Clancy novel or a John Le Carre novel with a click of a button that's written only for us. And let's say we want it tailored to an IQ of 110 for the vocab, but half the length. And we don't want a particular kind of violence. On the one hand, that sounds wonderful. And we have everything we want at our fingertips. But then there's another moment where you think, well, we're all floating around like the characters in the Pixar movie Wally, -E, being fed our own information, getting all of our own needs met in a microcosm where we are disconnected from an overarching narrative and we're disconnected from each other. And we've seen the 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 falling out of the bottom of that with the with the death of appointment viewing in TV, where we used to have a much more shared experience through entertainment. And now we can scarcely have a conversation, right? Oh, I'm watching White Lotus. Well, what's that on? I'm in season one. You're in season two. Don't tell me anything. We're removed more and more. And what's very interesting is some of the AI sort of summits I've been attending, we've brought in theological thinkers. And in a way, this sort of mosaicing of the human experience mirrors in a certain regard an evangelical notion of hell where everybody is distant from God and from each other. Everyone is floating in, in our own little microcosms. And so community is very important. You know, when Sean has a book that he's created that deals with AI, and in fact, he's had his sleeves rolled up and his hand shoved into the clay of creating this uh, with AI also, but everyone's reading one book still. Everybody can read his one book that came out last month and discuss it. And there's a community around that. And I think what people are hungering for more than anything else is to have communities that are brought together and I think that if we have this surfeit of options that are highly customizable and tailored, 
we can see to some extent some of the havoc that we've seen run, for instance, with pornography in young men, where they can have everything they conceivably want until the bottom has completely fallen out of human relationships and intimacy in a lot of regards. So, yeah, I was going to ask just John pick up to, to, yeah. on something that Greg said. Um, I mean, I think that there's something interesting in what he's talked about, about this desire. You know, he started by talking about this, that humans do seek out excellence and don't want to watch AI just play basketball towards each other, against each other. But also the contrast of the, this idea that people don't necessarily know what they need. They maybe know what they want, but don't know what they need. And that on the other hand, they might be attracted to sort of low quality content, low excellence content that's more simulated. I don't think I share his optimism that the market will really like head and continue to head towards human generated excellence in all domains or in even in very many domains of arts and entertainment. I think there's actually a very big appetite if you look on YouTube kids and some of those scandals or that really, you know, our kind of initial repugnance aside, the, the market will kind of start to gobble up this trash. And certainly there's a large amount of writing of literature that is kind of low quality and just checks the boxes mm -hmm. of scratches and itch. But I think as he's also indicated, first of all, by kind of automating that low excellence or whatever, the, the more inferior stratum of literature, that's kind of how you become good. I don't believe that like great writers pop out of somebody's cranium fully formed. It's through this work and training and repetition and whatever, 10,000 hours of work, often in low skill writing jobs that you, you know, get your feet underneath you. And with those removed, it really threatens, I think, the flourishing of creators. And similarly, as he said, but just to underline it, I think that if publishers and industry kind of races towards the bottom of using low quality content to give audiences what they think they want, before long, audiences are gonna start feeling hungry again. And I think that really publishers, if this is a publishing kind of conference, there needs to be a certain amount of solidarity and long-term thinking about the future of the book, about the future of storytelling. And we can't just be skidding away towards, towards where the easy short-term money is. None of us can, because it really hollows out like this, this beautiful <laughs> gleaming jewel at the heart of, you know, civilization. <laughs> For, I, I actually, it seems yeah. very like grand, but I, I kind of mean it. Well, and there's a reason that many of us are involved in publishing is to protect that vision and, and to be part of that vision. But I, you know, I think that this gets into one of the core issues that AI raises that many people would push back on some of what you've argued and say, well, people just want another bodice ripper and they just want, um, you know, another thriller that they don't even know who the author is and so forth. But I, I think that the reverse is actually true. I mean, people do want another bodice ripper of whatever genre that they're most interested in, or maybe they do want another space thriller, but they actually do want that community. I mean, I, I, I think what Greg has said is really important and relevant there that, you know, they want to be part of a broader communication around a particular uh, genre, a particular author, right? And we see this over and over in, um, in surveys about discovery, uh, when people are looking for that next book, of, of knowing that I liked Greg's last book, I'm way more likely to try Greg's new book, right? And, um, and that's a huge boost in terms of, of uh, picking that book off the shelf, buying it, and wanting to read it. And, and so I think that that continuity um, is really interesting. And, and I think, you know, that that's, that's pretty pivotal in, in how, you know, we work creatively in this industry uh, to generate material. So, you know, as we get a little bit closer to the end of our time, I, I, I want to start raising some of those, not practical questions, but we've talked about, um, you know, the importance of, of these um, uh, of keeping the hand in, right? Uh, keeping the unique authoring hand in. So what tools are, are you, either of you using? And do you worry about how your voice might change as you exercise your own engagements with AI tools? Or do you, do you feel fully empowered and embrace that learning experience? How does that, how do you see that? Greg? 
Well, I'm a bit of a slower adopter, I think, maybe than than Sean in that, you know, look, we use spell check, we use Google search, we already have AI processes that we're using and we're familiar with. And I think sometimes the slippery slope argument is, uh, you know, can can be oversimplifying because everything exists in a slippery slope to some extent. One of the things I've found immensely useful is I'm using AI as a personal assistant. And so one of the things I, that can work for me is if I'm writing a scene in a thriller that takes place in Maine in February and I want a sunset, I can just type in what time does the sunset in Maine in February and I can get an answer. Whereas the number of clicks and websites I would need to go through to arrive at that would be a lot longer. For anything important, I'm double checking that um, after the fact. I'm making sure that it's sourced because AI isn't as yet always predictable. But from a personal assistant perspective, it's been immensely helpful and it saves me a lot of time. And I feel like it's able to um, help me grab information that I want to keep building things out within my own voice and within my own aesthetic, just at a quicker rate, the same way that having, um, you know, spell check up on the computer can help me move a little bit quicker as I'm going forward. Sean, what about you? You've, you've written AI into this last work. Um, and that's obviously a, a topical um, narrative. Did you come out of that experience feeling differently ab about how AI is impacting your work? Well, I did. I mean, I was, I, I've been working on this book since 2019. I used earlier versions of GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, and then I had to work and develop with a programmer, a custom tuned AI to to generate some of the poetry that appears in the book that I, and I, I won't get into all the details, but I've heard a lot of authors express this confidence that AI can't disrupt or kind of nudge at them because of how banal and, and bland and terrible the writing at, on ChatGPT is. And I think it's important to express to those writers that ChatGPT is not a good um, barometer of where this technology is and what it's capable of. It's been deliberately configured to be as bland and banal and just chat servant personal assistant-ish as possible. The technology underneath ChatGPT that just is trying to predict the next word in a sequence is just as kind of deft or relatively deft at mimicking writing style as some of the image generators are that can, you know, create a Wes Anderson Star Wars and so on. The, you know, GPT-4 is pretty good at doing faux Le Carre or maybe even faux Shawn Michaels if I were to feed it enough of my content. At the same time, the fear I have, I'm on the one hand impressed with what this tech can do, disturbed by it, some delighted, unsettled, uh, like repug, repug, repudié, you'd say in French. Um, yeah. But on the, at the same time, just I know we're short on time. I, I do want to say that I think it's very dangerous that we're moving towards this monolithic AI, that certain really big AI companies and their tools are the ones that are all being, that are being set up for us all to use. I think as artists, as we imagine the future of this technology, we should want less like this big authority, this big pyramid we go to, to, to get help with our writing or, or a collaborator with our art, but rather these like gnarly, weird familiars that we might have loaded onto our machine that are much more trained to our own weird creative peccadillos and interests and the kind of conversations we want to enter into rather than some bland monolith. And I think the more that we feed these oligopolies of these, these giant AI corporations, we're kind of helping to feed art towards an industrialized mode, even on that creative plane. I could say more about that. <laughs> well, we have five minutes left. So I, I do want to get into some of those larger questions, actually. You know, I, I think um, when the, the AIs burst uh, into public visibility a, a year ago with the GPTs, uh, despite the fact, as many of our uh, earlier panelists have noted, we've all been living in a world of AI anyway. The moment you take a picture with your mobile phone, uh, there's a tremendous amount of code that's helping to frame and optimize the photographs that you're taking. And, and that is a version of AI, just like GPT, um, that you're interacting with in a chat interface. Um, many commentators noted that it was really that the, the imposition of that interface where you could talk or chat with an AI that really made its 
uh, impact obvious for the first time um, in, in the many works of life and, and work that we all engage in. So I, I guess for me, and, and Sean, you're touching this, and, and Greg, you noted uh, some of it earlier. Um, you know, how do you feel as, as an author, this is really shaping your understanding of, of both art, but also of our understanding of who we are as humans. And you were talking a little bit about that divide between human and machine. And, you know, there's an argument that we are we all are increasingly cyborgian um, and that we're leveraging tools in our daily lives in a, to an extent that we've never had before. We really have a technology assisted civilization at this point and, and that shapes our expectations of our daily lives. And uh, uh, Greg, I guess I'll ask you that question first of like, how do, you, how do you see that evolution? And do you think something real is changing or do you think this is just a powerful new technology and we're just gonna to learn to work with it in the same way that we've learned to work with other technological advances. Um, I think that the latter is possible if we can get on top of it. You know, by the same token, we've seen a lot of narratives that a lot of us share in that aren't necessarily reflected through algorithms and our bifurcated news sources and social media. It depends who has control. I think Sean's quite astute when he's pointing to you know, it's funny because there's a, I don't, there's a libertarian, you know, aspect of this for me that ignites, which, which, which thinks a lot about competition and innovation and rewarding those rather than feeding everything into one technopoly. The more that we do that, the more we're going to be at the behest of a technopoly. Um, you know, I have a friend who's a, who's a, one of the preeminent computer chip designers who's building an AI computer and he was quite confident that within a few years, we would be able, he would be able to generate an Abokov novel. And I said, with all the pauses, with all the unpredictability, with all the humor, and he thought that that was absolutely the case. And in the, in, in the six months or so that, that since we had that initial conversation, he has become a little bit less confident in that um, because to replicate something that's already existing is obviously a big strength of generative AI. But to make a leap of something that's new, that's random, part of that is, is, I think, what's essential to the human experience. When I talked about a spark of humanity, he sort of laughed at me and said, oh, so you believe in magic, right? And so I think of this a lot more that I think what, what we're increasingly going to see is the brand, which is a term that I don't like to use with artists, but let me just use it because you all know what, I, what, what I'm talking about. The brand, in a certain regard, I think for some authors is going to become the author him or herself rather than the books in the book series an author or artist that's moving through time because as we move through time traumas happen to us suffering happens to us joy happens to us what's going to happen for what we would want to express as artists or writers through the course of a life and all of its unpredictable uh, unpredictability including damage and trauma and suffering as well as positives I don't think that that's a path that AI can chart, the kind of leaps that we're going to make with the kind of dense and, um, you know, soaring highs that life can sometimes offer us. And so I think that as we're moving across time, I, I'm, I'm confident that what feels new, that what's going to feel like it is grabbing to people, it's calling to people, it's pulling them into community and shared conversations is going to be something that has a draw that is still going to have an uh, a fundamentally uh, human set of hands at the wheel. Excellent. So that brings a more optimistic framing, I think, ultimately to this transformation. Sean, last words. I think that we have to remember and kind of maybe even enjoy some of the questions that are raised here. I don't think I have all of Greg's confidence that the simulation of literature is as easily recognizable as, as a simulation. Uh, as a fiction writer, I'm sometimes really vividly aware of how much, how unsure I am whether what I'm doing is you know, true and beautiful art or the simulation thereof. Certainly when I'm sitting down at the page, I, I'm often not sure. But what I am certain of is that question, the kind of like the questions that AI brings up for me about like, what is art? 
What does it mean if you can be fooled by fake art? What is fake art to begin with? Those questions are actually exciting questions for art to dig into and for us as artists to engage with. And in that way, there's kind of a new landscape opening up with some questions that are differently put ahead of us. Thank you both. Um, as we close out this panel, Greg, your last work is, or upcoming work is? Uh, a new Orphan X book of mine just came out of my thriller series called The Last Orphan. Uh, and the next one called Lone Wolf is gonna be out in February. Great, and Sean. And I'm the author work? of Do You Remember Being Born? I'd love if you could read it. Great, thank you both so much. Uh, your perspectives are so critical for us and um, really wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. Good to see you, Sean.